name is uh, Nathaniel Ford Jr., born in Carnegie, Pennsylvania. I'm uh, one of uh, eight children. I was raised with seven sisters. Uh, father uh, worked uh, U.S. Steel for about 36 years. My mother was a housewife. Uh, we moved to Pittsburgh in about, 19, about 1947. And uh, went to school at, uh, <laughs> and, uh, what was it? Uh, I can't remember the grade school. Hmm. Anyway, I went to junior high school at uh, Heron Hill Junior High. From there, I went to Shinley High School. I got tired of high school, so I decided to join the military in 1953. Uh, joined the uh, Army. Airborne unassigned, or airborne. And in uh, June of uh, 53, was sent to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, the 11th Airborne Division. Took basic. Finished up basic training around about September of 1953. From there, went into Fort Benning, Georgia. Attended jump school, graduated uh, 20 November of 1953. At uh, which time, I uh, was on orders to go to Japan. I uh, thought I'd be assigned to 187 Airborne Regimental Combat Team. But when we got to California, a bunch of uh, paratroopers showed up from 11th Airborne, 82nd, 101st. So when we got into Yokohama, they took us up to Camp Drake, which was a replacement center in Japan, outside of Tokyo. And uh, when we got into uh, Camp Drake, there was about 50 buses waiting to pick all these guys up to take them down to 187. So we knew that our chances of going was slim to none. And none was basically about it. I was assigned to 24th Infantry Division in Korea. Uh, they took us by boat from uh, Yokohama down to Sasebo, I believe it was. From Sasebo, they put us on LSTs, took us across the canal to Pusan, Korea. I uh, got into Pusan, the temperature was 10 degrees below zero. Uh, stayed there for about uh, four days. I was reassigned to 19th Infantry Regiment, which was on Kojido Island. And during the war, I understand it was Part of, uh, it was a POW camp there. So I stayed on Kojido Island for, from January 54 to about April of 54. And we decided to pull us back to Pusan. So we uh, real headed from uh, Pusan to Chungcheong, which is uh, northeast of, uh, in Korea. Uh, from there, they trucked us over to an area called uh, Yangu Valley. And we stayed in Yangu Valley from uh, April of uh, 1954 to November. They brought us back uh, to Pusan, uh, the camp number five outside of Pusan, and we were part of uh, uh, a guard that, at that time the Army was taking out all the war equipment, and so we guarded the docks to keep uh, pilferaging that down. The other regiment was 34th Infantry. They were over at uh, Hialeah Compound, and you had uh, UN observers there. So they were responsible for guarding the UN's observers. So we stayed in uh, Pusan from uh, uh, June, June of 1955. And June 1955, I was uh, taken up to Incheon, but on a boat, shipped back to the States. I was stationed at Fort Hood, Texas uh, from June of 55 to June of 56. And that's when I said I'd never come back to Texas. It was quite an experience. I got out in 56. Uh, at that time, the Army had what they called uh, mustering out pay. So they would give you $100 a year the month that you got out, then they would give you $100 in the next two months. And that was supposed to help you readjust to being a civilian. Uh, so I got out. I didn't do much of anything. I ran the streets uh, for about a month. And one morning, my dad told me that uh, we needed to have a conversation. So we went down to breakfast, and he says, well, you know, you've uh, been out for about a month and a half. You haven't done anything but run the streets. He said, that's not acceptable, he said. So I'm going to give you three options here. He said, I'll give you 30 days to think it over, and then you make up your mind what you want to do. He said, go back in the Army. And I thought about that, and I'm saying, no. Me and the Army didn't get along that well, so I was still with the Army. He said, well, you can find you another place to live. And I'm thinking uh, the only place I can go to is my sister's homes, but they got kids, husbands, they're going to uh, play that me running the streets in and out. He said, I'll get a job. 
got 30 days. So within a week and a half, I found me a job. I uh, worked in the Western uh, Children's Psychiatric Hospital uh, as a busboy in the cafeteria. I worked there about two months. Uh, one of the ladies asked me one day if I was a veteran. And I says, yeah. And she said, well, you know, the VA is hiring veterans to become nursing assistants. And uh, so I went to uh, the government building, filled out the paperwork, was hired uh, by the VA. So I worked for the uh, VA as a nursing assistant from, uh, I'd say, about uh, August of 1956 to September of 58, uh, at which time I kept getting this urge to go back in the military. By that time I was married, had a son, and uh, sat down and talked to the wife, told her that uh, I needed to go back into the military. And uh, she says, well, if that's what you want, no problem. So I went back in in 1958. I was assigned to 101st Airborne Division, Fort Campbell. Uh, I got in, I felt that being prior service, I knew everything there was to know. But uh, they put us all in the auditorium. And uh, they gave us a briefing on the division's history. And the guy says, we do one thing here, we do it very professionally. We soldier. And if you can't soldier, now's the time to leave. Because if you go to your unit and can't soldier, we will put you in jail. And uh, so I thought about it, and I'm saying, I can hang. So I was assigned to uh, A Company, 1st Airborne Battle Group, 501st Infantry, Geronimo. And I stayed there from September of 1958 to September of 1961. I re-enlisted, went to Fort Bragg, served with 2nd second, uh, second 504 uh, from 61 to 64. Went back to Korea, 64, 65. I was assigned to 7th uh, Infantry Division at Camp Casey, Korea. And a nice little community called uh, TD, we called it TDC. Uh, name of it was Tongdu Chani Po Sani Up. So I stayed there from June of uh, uh, 64 to June of 65. Returned back to Fort Campbell, uh, Kentucky in 65. Retrained from 65 to 66. And from there we were assigned to 173rd Airborne Brigade in Vietnam. We deployed in uh, May of 66 on a troop carrier that I went to Korea on in 1954, which was the USS Pope. So we uh, departed uh, about the 26th of May from Oakland, California, landed in Vong Tau, Vietnam, uh, served to 173rd from June of 1966 to June of 67. Came back to Fort Campbell uh, in time for the Detroit riots. Uh, we were involved in the Detroit riots. Got back from the Detroit riots, and the 2nd and 3rd Brigades were uh, already alerted to go to Vietnam. So they asked us if we wanted to stay, and they wanted us to sign paperwork because uh, we were told that uh, we had a one year turnaround. And so I'm saying, well, I just got home. I got two sons, and uh, I have no desire to go back to Vietnam. So they asked me where I wanted to go. I said, Fort Bragg. So being in the Army and giving you what they want or what you want, they sent me to Fort Benning, Georgia. When you did your first tour in Korea, that was 1954? 54, 55, yes. And what, what was it like to be there just following the war? Uh, well, to me it was interesting. I'd never been outside the United States in my life. In fact, when I went in the Army, uh, the first time I ever rode in an airplane was from Fort Meade, uh, Maryland, to Fort Calma, Kentucky. And... Uh, then next time I rode on the airplane, uh, I jumped out of it five times and then never rode an airplane again after that until I went back in service. But uh, to go to Korea, it was uh, something I'd seen on television. Uh, it was odd to be in a country where uh, nobody looked like you. Uh, it was a different language, a different culture. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, and 54, 55, it... Uh, it was a little rough because the uh, president at that time, he didn't have uh, much patience with American troops. And uh, Sigmund Rhee uh, felt that we should all go home. And uh, then I came out in 55, but it was just the difference in the terrain and the people. And uh, I've never seen... Uh, uh, people that worked that hard as farmers. And uh, 
But the only problem that I had with it was that uh, during lunchtime they would uh, fertilize the fields. And to fertilize the fields, they would come on post and they would empty out uh, out of trees. That's what they fertilized the fields with. And they would wait till about uh, 10 minutes to 11. They would start uh, uh, fertilizing the fields and we start eating. And the wind would blow through the compound. And you could tell those that have been there for a while and those that haven't. And the guys that just got there, they were saying, how can you do it? You adjust to it. You know? And uh, the people were friendly. Uh, we had a good time there. Uh, we trained quite a bit, uh, especially up in Yangu Valley. But once we came back to Pusan, it was all guard work. And then when I went back in 64, uh, there was a lot of changes. Uh, a lot of uh, more modern buildings. I was in the uh, little town of TDC. And at that time, there was only two cities on limits to the military. One was posted on the other was uh, Seoul. And so if you wanted uh, to get a three-day pass, you had to take it to go to Seoul because they had um, a recreation center outside of Seoul. Uh, married troops couldn't bring their families unless you were assigned to 8th uh, uh, Army. And in 8th Army, you could bring your families in uh, in Seoul. Uh, so we... <clears throat> We ran around, and I was a bachelor, and uh, I enjoyed myself, and uh, I left. And I, uh, when I ended up in Germany, it was because I was trying to get back to Korea. And uh, I felt that if I, if I bugged DA long enough, if I just kept calling, they would say, give him what he wants and let him go. And so I kept calling. About the third call, the guy told me, he said, uh, uh, you know, because at that time I was an E7. And he said, you know, you never had a long tour. And I said, I don't want one. I said, uh, when I tried to go to Germany from Vietnam, I said, you changed my orders, sent me back to Fort Benny. So I'm not going to Germany. I said, I want to go to Korea. And uh, the guy said, well, he said, uh, let me put it to you this way. He said, you'll have orders in 60 days. You got one of two choices, go to Germany or go home. I went to Germany. So, uh, but other than that, uh, I had no, no problem with the military. I think, uh, I think the military did me a great uh, service. In fact, uh, it made me grow up in a hurry because uh, uh, my first tour, my attitude was they should be glad to have me and I should be able to do what I wanted to do. And they didn't see it that way. And so when I went out the first time, and that's why I said I'd never come back in the Army or come back to Texas. And uh thought about it, and I think the... Uh, Best thing that happened to me was being assigned to 101st because they were very professional. And you were either professional or you were gone. One of the two. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, when I went to the 82nd, it was the same way. And I think that my enjoyment was we traveled a lot. And we jumped in different parts of uh, the country, and that was great. And being a paratrooper uh, was probably the greatest thing of all because we did something that nobody else could do. And I would jump out of a perfectly good aircraft for no reason whatsoever. And uh, we would go places, and you would hear people say, here's a paratrooper from the 101st and the 82nd. And uh, that was great. And uh, we were, all of us were the best of friends. We fought amongst ourselves, but nobody else could get involved. Uh, but I think the, the uh, Six or seven years I'd spent on jump status were probably the best that I had. I went to ranger school. I became an instructor in ranger school. And there was the same thing there. Yeah, he's the airborne ranger. And that was you up here. And that was everybody else down here, as far as we were concerned. And uh, uh, if uh, I don't know if I could hang with today's Army or not, uh, it's totally different. Uh, it's a, a different world out there uh, today. But... Uh, like I said, it did me very well. And I gave the Army what they wanted, and they've given me what I wanted. And I can't complain. Have you been back to Korea at all since your tours? No, ma'am, I haven't. Uh, I went to uh, a dinner that they had here th this year, and they were showing us uh, a film of different parts of Korea, and I couldn't believe it. And I'm looking at them saying, I was in that part, but I don't remember that. 
you know, it's, it's built up to a point now it's uh, probably about as modern as any other city uh, there is. Because when I went to Korea the first time, uh, a guy was telling me about a three-man shovel. And I said, there's no such thing as a three-man shovel. But there is. And I saw it in Korea. And uh, it just fascinated me, you know, that uh, you got three men on, on a shovel that is meant for one, you know. And uh, they were a fairly poor country at that time uh, in, the, in 54. And, uh, Can you describe for me what is a three-man shovel? Oh, three-man shovel? You have the shovel, you got the guy behind the shovel. Then you got a rope going this way and a rope going that way. So the guy that got the shovel, he digs it in, and when he breaks the dirt, and they pull it up and they throw the dirt. And I thought that was unique. I said, uh, I've never seen that before in my life. Uh, when I went back, like I say, you know, it was a lot more modern in 64, 65. Um, and we trained quite a bit. Uh, we were about uh, 20 miles from the DMZ, uh, so we were, got alerted quite a bit. Uh, but we did most of our training in the local areas. Uh, they, they put us through some changes, uh, the Koreans did. Uh, we had uh, what they call katusas, which were Korean soldiers augmented to the army. They spoke, read, and wrote English better than we could. I mean, these guys were sharp. And uh, they were good soldiers, and uh, we had a few that didn't particularly care for American soldiers, but uh, that's, that was acceptable. But overall, I thought uh, they were very well trained. I saw uh, their Marines, their uh, outstanding dudes. Uh, airborne soldiers, I had a first-hand account with those guys. They came into a club one night we were in, and uh, the owners told them that uh, they couldn't come in because this is where the GIs come, and the Koreans couldn't come in. And their response was, who's going to put us out? And uh, they looked around, there was about five of us that had just come out of the 82nd. So they saw the wings, and they talked to us, and uh, uh, they wanted to turn the place out. And we said, man, we can't do that. You know, we work with these guys. Don't worry about it, he says. And he pulled a little notebook out, and he wrote a name on it, and the phone number, and he gave it to me, and he says, if you have any problems, call this number and speak to me. We'll come up here and we'll solve the problem for you. And we said, well, man, why don't you guys dance, man? Let me buy you a drink. Yeah. And we don't want to fight nobody here. And, uh, but they were very sharp. Uh, we trained with the, I think it was the Capital Division. And uh, their discipline was very strict. They, uh, there was no excuses not to do what you were supposed to do. And a lot of times I said, I wish we could do to, their so to, to our soldiers what they do to theirs, because it was no, uh, no mistakes were allowed, and you suffered from that. And, uh, but we operated with them once, and uh, very good uh, troops, and uh, I tried to get back in, uh, in the 70s and 80s, and uh, I mean, they had no openings for uh, E7 or E8, so I just stayed in Germany six years and retired. So how did your time in Korea affect your view of U.S.-Korea relations? Well, at that time, it was, uh, I got maybe a little strange, especially uh, the second time around. You know, the first time around, we didn't have that much contact uh, with the military, strictly uh, civilians. And uh, at that time, in, in uh, uh, 54, 55, it was all about uh, their trying to survive. Is basically what it was. When I went back to 64, 65, uh, we had pretty good relations with them, uh, but you always had that one element that uh, wanted to take whatever you had, and we had a problem uh, at Camp Casey. Uh, they were stealing ammunition from us, and it was to make brass objects. So they would uh, steal a case of uh, a rifle ammunition. There was a bunker on top of the hill from the, uh, the war, and... Uh, they would sit there and they would pull the bullets off and they just dumped the gunpowder in the floor. And uh, when we found it, they had enough gunpowder in the floor of this bunker, they could have blew half the mountainside away. Uh, they were good with their hands. Uh, brass was a big thing. And we went up to Teardrop Range 
and of qualifications. And it was uh, company, uh, infantry company in the attack. And the platoon I was in, we were supporting the other three uh, platoons. And they were going across the valley, and we were firing at the mountain across the valley. And uh, my platoon sergeant, uh, platoon leader, told me, he says, uh, Sergeant Ford, he said, watch that machine gun right there. And I'm saying, well, what's he doing wrong? No, I just want you to look at it. So I'm sitting there, I'm saying, I don't see nothing he's doing wrong. No, no, I don't want you to look at him. I want you to look in front of the gun. And I'm saying, for what? He said, just, just look at the front of the gun. So I'm sitting there, and he was squeezed off about 10 or 12 rounds, and you see this little black thing bob up and bob down. And I'm saying, it can't be what I think it is. He said, I think it is. So we stopped firing, and there's this old lady sitting right underneath the machine gun, and she was timing this guy. And he would fire off about 12 rounds, and she would raise up, grab all the brass, and then she'd pull it back down. And uh, we said, we can't let her sit there. So we got one of the Katusas to talk to her and was telling her that if he changes his rhythm, he'll kill her. He'll take the top of her head off. And uh, she was crying and about, uh, you know, she needed the money and the young people would take the brass from her. And so after about 30 minutes of talking to her, we had to convince her that we would give her all the brass from this machine gun and all the brass from the other machine gun and that we would give her an escort to her home so that the young people wouldn't take it from her before she would come and sit behind the gun. And so that she sat behind the gun. So when it was over, we gave her all the brass, gave her escort to take her home. So that night, we had the night firing uh, uh, in the valley. So we were on the mountainside, we were firing across the valley and uh, mortars are firing flares and flare would go up and flare would get about five feet off the ground and would just take off. And we're saying, can't be nobody down there. With all this firing that we're doing, we would have had to hit somebody. Another flare would go off and it would come down, it would take off. So it was a game. See if you can hit who's running with the flare. Never hit who was running with the flare. But it was, uh, they wanted to, uh, to make a living so bad that they would do uh, anything to get it. Uh, no matter how dangerous it was, they felt they could live through it. And uh, I've talked to people who was in other units, and same thing, they go to range, they'd have to stop firing because you had people running around trying to pick up brass so they could sell it. And, uh, but it was beautiful country. Uh, in TDC we had, uh, what was the mountain? We had a mountain, we was in sort of like a valley. And on the other side of the mountain was a resort. And you go up to the resort and you had uh, vendors, you had caves up there, waterfall, beautiful place. So uh, on the weekends in the summer, we take our girlfriends up there and, uh, uh, for half a day and then come back. Uh, but the whole idea of uh, being there was that uh, we were there to train and we trained. Uh, if we wanted to know something, we asked Mama San and she could tell us anything that was going on. And Mama San would say, you're going to field Monday. No, we're not. You're going to field Monday. No, no. Nobody said anything about going to field Monday. They alerted Sunday night, Monday morning, we're on trucks and we're gone. Mama saw knew where we were going, how long we would be gone, and when we were coming back. Uh, so he had better intelligence than we did. Um, Who's Mama Son? Well, Mama was normally the eldest of the, of the, of the women. And Mama Son uh, controlled the houses, uh, they ran the bars, and this sort of thing. And uh, they were, like I said, they would go with their hands. A lot of guys had, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Gentleman's Quarterly magazines. It has all the latest fashion. You could take that to any tailor and say, this is what I want. And he'll give it to you just like that. I mean, beautiful uh, workmanship. Uh, the only problem was uh, the thread wasn't strong enough. And after about eight months, it started coming apart. So a lot of guys, when they got back to the States, they would have it re-sewed. Uh, but beautiful work. Uh, if they could see it, they could do it. It was as simple as that. And uh, we had uh, equipment uh, that would disappear in the units. And so when we would go out, if you had something you wanted to keep, we had the Katusas that would stay in. I had a radio. So when I would go out, I'd give it to Katusas in my platoon. So they'd listen to music all night. And I left it in my room one night, came back, and it was gone. And I said, well, my mistake. I should have gave it to these guys. I'd have kept it. Uh, 
we had a lot of uh, thievery uh, that was going on, but that was about par for the country. It was all all over the place. Uh, we had nice clubs to go to, um, NCO clubs, uh, AM clubs, clubs off post. Uh, we could go to the clubs uh, until I think they closed at midnight. We had to be back in at midnight. At 1 o'clock, we had bed check. And it would go through to check to make sure everybody was in. And if you weren't in, then uh, you had to go talk to first sergeant and sergeant major, which meant that uh, you were on your way to see the colonel, and then you had a, a major problem from, from that point on. But uh, that was about, about it. It was really nice. I enjoyed it. What were your duties while you were in Korea? I was infantry. I was uh, Infantry, when I was there the first time, I was a rifleman. Uh, second time I was there, I was a uh, infantry squad leader. And uh, like I said, the first year, or the first tour there wasn't, uh, we trained a lot until we came back to Pusan, and then that's when we started pulling guard. So it was, uh, you'd be on uh, for 12 hours, then you come off, you'd be off for the next day and a half, and switch it back and forth. And uh, did that for about eight months before rotating back to the States. Second time we trained, uh, we went up around the DMZ and we trained up there. And I told the guy, I said, uh, the guys that fought here had to been hell of goddamn soldiers. These mountains ain't short. And I said, we're sitting on a mountain that took us something like three and a half to four hours to get up. And you think that that's the tallest piece that's there. But when you get up there and you still had trenches from the war and we're in the trenches and you're looking across the valley and that one is higher than the ones that you're sitting on. And I'm saying, how did these guys come off of that mountain, come across the valley, come up this mountain? And I said, uh, it's like you have to be part Billy Goat to do it. And I said, so you have to take your hats off to these guys that fought there. Because I think after about the third mountain, I would have probably sat down and said, that's it, man. I'm not going any further on these bad boys. But uh, the DMZ was uh, manned by, at that time, the first calf was up there. And you had the first calf, you had several uh, South Korean units uh, that pulled guard on the DMZ itself. And it was a very sensitive area. Uh, we went up to, because uh, 7th Division the football team was playing the first calf, and we made a wrong turn. And we ended up at the DMZ. And they laid us out on the road, all of us. And they were upset telling us that uh, we were trying to defect to the north. We said, man, we're coming here for a football game. We just made a bad turn. And they kept saying, no, you're trying to defect north. And uh, they had to bring some colonel in from uh, First Calf to explain to them that we were from uh, TDC and we were there to watch a football game. And we made a bad turn. And uh, they said, well, if you'll take uh, charge of them and be responsible for them, then you can have them. And he says, okay. So we got on the truck, they took us down to the stadium, and uh, we watched the football game, followed everybody else out of there so we could get back down to TDC. But uh, it was a lot of uh, activity was going on as far as infiltration by the north and infiltration by the south. They were still going uh, back and forth. And at Camp Casey, I got there June of 64, and uh, they were telling us that the mountain – that was, we were at the base of this mountain, and that there was a 12-man squad from uh, North Korea was up on the mountain. And they had drew a plans of the whole uh, regiment that was in the valley. Every building, every headquarters building, motor pools, everything. And nobody knew they were there. They got hungry, and they said a couple of them came off the mountain to try to get some food from one of the farmers. Farmers gave them the food, they went back up on the mountain. Farmers came down and told the Army, you got guys up here from North Korea. And so they went up and I think they said it was something like 12 guys were up here. And they had a drawing of our compound. They had a drawing of the 34th, which was on the other side of the uh, mountain compound. They had marked division headquarters, uh, regimental headquarters, or brigade headquarters, and uh, battalion headquarters. So they knew everything that was on that post. And uh, we've seen films where uh, Korean uh, infiltrators had been caught and killed and sent back. Uh, so it was a lot of activity uh, as far as infiltration going on between the North and the South. Uh, but uh, other than that, we, we didn't have any contact with these guys. 
they were mainly trying to get into soul and uh, some made it and I guess some of them didn't. But other than that, we just trained and had a good time and enjoyed ourselves and came on out. What are some life lessons that you feel like you learned through your military service? In military service? I think one thing that, uh, that they built into us was that uh, in order to accomplish anything, you have to have uh, the support of everybody that's around you. You had to be a team player. You couldn't be an individual. Uh, and I think that carries over uh, from the military as far as how you are to conduct yourself, how you treat people. Uh, and I think that every veteran that has come out of the military and worked in civilian life has found out it's totally two different worlds. But you have a difference in the mindset as to how you work and what time you go to work. And the military has always taught us that if you, are, if you have an appointment at 7 o'clock, you should get there no later than 645 because that gives you time in case something happens to still make that 7 o'clock appointment. Uh, <clears throat> civilians look at it from a standpoint, they leave home at a quarter to you, and they might make it on time, they might not make it on time, and it's a way of life that they do it. The leadership that you have in the military is what you bring into civilian life. And you have to make some adjustments because the military uh, system is a lot uh, stronger and a lot harder uh, than civilians. Civilians, you can get you a lawyer, drag it on for 20 years. Army, you might drag it on for 20 hours, and then something's going to happen to you, either good or bad, one of the two. Uh, but you have uh, that ingrained in you that you're in charge, you're responsible for the people that you've got. And uh, there used to be an old saying in the Army that, uh, you're responsible for everything that your troops do or don't do. So it's on you. And you bring that to the table when you come out to become a civilian. Is that if I got people that's under me, I'm responsible for all of them. And to be responsible, they have to understand how I think and then what I want from them. And then you take it from there. And if you can't get the people that want to do it the, the way that you want to do it and everybody else is doing it, then you just have them transferred someplace else. But the military is just uh, all about following instructions. Uh, it's uh, regimented, uh, it's an everyday event uh, based on your ability to lead is gonna determine how far you go in the military. And if you can't lead, then you got a problem. You'll follow somebody else. And uh, one of the things I learned uh, when I became an NCO uh, my first sergeant told me, he says, you've just become an NCO in the United States Army. You no longer spec four. He said, now, if you want to hang with the spec fours, he said, I'll tell you what I can do for you. I can adjust your pay grade to fit your ability. I can put you back down to that spec four. It's up to you from here on out. And my platoon sergeant told me, he says, if you play with a puppy, he'll lick your face. And I'm looking at this guy and saying, what does a puppy have to do with what I'm doing? And basically what he was telling me is that uh, kindness kills. And if you're supposed to train to do something, that's what you do. You train for that. You don't take no shortcuts. You don't show no favoritism. And that's what he was telling me, that if you want to be kind to everybody, then eventually you'll kill them because you'll go into a situation where they have to respond to what you say. And if they won't respond, uh, then you're going to get them killed, you're going to get yourself killed. And one of the things they had in the Army about uh, a private being dumb, and a private's probably the smartest person out there. He understands what's going on around him. He knows what he's supposed to do. And if he can get away with not doing it, he'll do it. But you let uh, the situation deteriorate to a point, and he'll tell you, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. This is what we're supposed to be doing. And he's saying, well, man, if you're that smart, how come you didn't get promoted? I don't want your responsibility. He said, but I'm not dumb. I see what's going on around me, and I know this isn't, isn't going the way it's supposed to go. Uh, so you pick up a lot of leadership skills uh, as to handle, how to handle men, how to handle situations. And you bring that with you when you come out. It doesn't just uh, stop. You learn about people uh, because you go into the military and you have people from all walks of life. 
You got them from the big cities, from the farmlands, from the ranches. Uh, when I came in the first time, we had a guy from uh, the Appalachian Mountains, and <clears throat> I couldn't understand how someone has never seen a pair of low quarters, and he had never seen it. And to him, the Army was the greatest thing to happen to him. The Army gave him clothes. He had uniforms, he had boots, and this fascinated him. And when we were graduating, he went to the clothing sales store, bought boots for his father, his brothers, his uncles. He said, none of us ever had a new pair of boots. And it's a different culture. And uh, we had an incident that, uh, later years I thought it was kind of funny. But at the time, it, uh, uh, racism was running hard. And uh, we came in off the rifle range. It was in Fort Campbell in Basie. And uh, we were cleaning the weapons. And at that time, we had the old barracks. He had 40 men in the, in the barracks. And he's sitting there and he's singing, and everything stopped. And you can hear somebody breathing in Washington, D.C. And we're looking at this guy, and it's a 40-man platoon, and about, I'd say about 18 of us are black. And he's sitting there, he's singing, any, many, many, mo, catch a nigger by the toe, if he hollers, let him go, any, many, many, mo. And we're looking at this guy like, does he understand what he just did? And uh, he's sitting there, and uh, we had a guy from uh, Kansas City, black guy, and a uh, mean little guy. I mean, he never smiled the whole time that we were together. I, I don't think he knew how to smile. But he carried a knife on him at all times. And he came down, and uh, there was a black guy that slept next to uh, this kid uh, named Goodwin from Chicago. And Goodwin said, man, what are you going to do, man? He says, he knows better. Goodwin said, no, he don't. He said, he doesn't understand what he just did. And the kid is sitting there like, well, what's going on? And uh, the man was talking about what are you going to do to him? And Goodman said, the only thing you can do right now is to go back to your bunk and sit down. I'll take care of him. And I uh, said, uh, you can either go back, I can put you back. Your choice. So the guy went back and sat down. So the kid asked me, he said, why is everybody upset? He said, do you know what you just did? And the kid says, no. He said, you, the song you just sang. And he sat there and he said, uh, what's wrong with it? Uh, my daddy sang it to me all the time. And uh, Goodwin told him, he says, well, he says, in today's society, a black man will kill you for what you just said. He apologized for the next six weeks of basic training. It hurt him that bad that he didn't want to hurt nobody's feelings. But I look back on it, I'm saying, it was comical because this guy had probably never been around black that much in his life. You come out of the mountains. And to him, it was a song that his father taught him. And his father taught it to him, so it couldn't have been wrong. And after it happened, he realized that he's insulted somebody. And that hurt his feelings. And, uh, but I just thought, uh, thought it was funny after it was over with that he sat there amongst all of us and it never dawned on him what, what he had done. You know? And uh, I'm saying, you learn. Uh, you got people from Chicago, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, New York. They all come from the big cities. And they got their little slick things they like to do. Uh, you got the guys from the small towns and the, the ranches and the farms. And they come from a different uh, environment. And uh, so you get to see how everybody thinks and what they want to do and uh, what they think about the world. And when I was in basic, uh, for about the first eight weeks, they wouldn't let us off post. And they finally uh, gave us passes to go off post to, uh, well, Fort Campbell sits on the border of Kentucky and Tennessee. In fact, the post was split in half. So we went to Clarksville, Tennessee, because it was the closest, about nine miles out. Hopkinsville, Kentucky was about 15 miles north, and uh, Clarksville was south of us. And uh, so we're in uniform, and we go down to Clarksville, and sometimes in those days, I used to forget where I was at. And it was me and the guy I came in service with, and about four white guys. They were from Montana and Wyoming area. So we go into the coffee shop, and we sit down, and we're sitting there talking. And after about 10 minutes, one of the guys says, uh, you know, the, um, 
waitress is ignoring us. So he called over and says, ma'am, said, uh, we've been here about 10 minutes and nobody's taking our orders. And she looked at me and she says, are you supposed to be black? And I said, ma'am, there's no supposed to be to it. I am. She said, well, I can't serve you. And the guy said, well, why can't you serve me? She said, it's the law. Now, if he wants to go around to the back, I'll serve him in the back door. So I got up and the guy says, no, man, you don't go to the back door. Oh, no, I'm not going to the back door. I'm going to the USO down there. They got donuts and, and uh, milk, and I'm going to go down there and drink a bottle of milk and eat a bottle of donuts. And then it dawned on me that you're south of the border, and regardless of whether you're in the military or not, things ain't going to change. Things will stay the same. And I think things stayed the same until Vietnam War. And uh, then after the Vietnam War, there was uh, a lot of changes in the military as far as rank went, uh, as far as attitude in the military, attitude around military bases uh, started changing. I got out of service in 56, I came back in 58, and nothing had really changed. Um, I was at Fort Campbell, we went to uh, Fort Stewart, Georgia, and uh, we had an armored uh, a battalion that was assigned to the division. And they had to go into Fort Stewart to qualify, but they needed an infantry company. And the company I was in, we got elected to go, and we went down and we trained, and we were coming back by bus, and we're in uniform. And we stopped at the Greyhound bus station in Atlanta, Georgia. And we're lined up, 140-something airborne soldiers lined up there, and the manager came out, told the company commander, uh-uh, all your black soldiers, dark-skinned Hispanics, We'll all have to go downstairs. And that's all of you, regardless of rank. And uh, country commander told him, says, uh, we're federal troops. He says, I don't care. He said, this is the state of Georgia. That's the law. So they put us down in the basement, and my platoon sergeant was down there, my platoon leader was there, and uh, the old man, he's really upset, and he's apologizing. He kept coming down apologizing to us. And... Uh, the lady that was doing the cooking, and she told us, says, uh, don't worry about it. She says, I'll see two of you better than anybody in this building. And she took care of us. And uh, coming back, we stopped at uh, some little small town. They had a Greyhound uh, pickup point. And we went in to eat, and they got a petition sent in there. And the uh, lady told the company commander, says, uh, uh, all your black soldiers have to eat behind the petition so they can't be seen from the street. And uh, he said, you know, he says, uh, I've been embarrassed once today. It won't be a second time. So he told us to take the petitions and set them on the sidewalk. So we took the petitions out, we set them on the sidewalk. He said, I want all my black soldiers up here right at the window. I want them to see who's here. So we sat there and she called the county police. The county cop come up and, uh, well, Maude, what can I do for you? He says, uh, I told him that his black soldiers would have to eat behind the petition and he made them put it outside, and I want you to make them leave. He says, well, Marty, he says, like it's here, said, uh, they're federal troops. I have no control over federal troops. So you got one of two choices. You can feed them or don't feed them. I ain't got nothing to do with it no more. Got his crews on left, and she fed us, but she fussed the whole time that she was feeding us. And uh, then, like I said, when the Vietnam War came along, uh, you had so many minorities in the military that uh, things started changing. Uh, but up to 64, there was still a lot of uh, military bases that uh, the towns refused to integrate. And uh, that was our biggest problem. Uh, the military was the other problem because we had very few se black senior NCOs, very few uh, uh, black officers. Uh, I saw my first uh, black lieutenant when I was in the 101st. He came in, he was one of about 10 that was in the division. And we had something like 10,000 troops in the division. And, uh, but then Vietnam War, and we started getting more senior NCO, more officers, more senior officers in the military. And uh, then things kind of played out a little bit, but you still got places like that. that uh, um, majority is not welcome, but uh, they'll accept it because they want your money. That's, that's, that's the bottom line. The almighty dollar uh, can make people change their minds. But uh, I think any, any way they're the one, I don't think I changed those days uh, for anything in life. I learned a lot. Uh, I grew a lot because um, I was telling my sons when they were growing up, I said, you know, 
I quit school because I was smarter than the teacher. And I said, and, uh, there was nothing the teacher could teach me that I didn't know. And I said, when I went in the Army, I said, I learned a lesson the first day I was in the replacement center. And these guys were sitting there talking about uh, their graduation, the prom, and all of that. And they said, what did you do on your prom? And I said, I quit school. And they looked at me. And the guy said, why? I couldn't tell him why. And uh, my teacher told me when I was telling her I was going there, she said, well, one thing about it said, one thing it'll do will make you grow up. So it'll make a man out of you. He said, second thing is that you're missing the best years of your life in high school. She said, once you graduate high school, I don't care where you go or what you do, your high school years will always be your favorite years. And, uh, and I told him, I said, and I missed all that because I was too smart. You know, I knew too much. And I said, and uh, when I came in the Army, I found out that uh, I wasn't the smartest bear in the woods. You know, I said, and uh, then I learned that if you don't have an education, you can't go nowhere, and unless you're very lucky, that you're smart enough, you can start your own building, become a millionaire. Then nobody cares whether you got a degree or not, you know. And I said, but uh, I learned that, and I said, I'll teach it to you, and uh, you'll either graduate from high school or you'll be the oldest uh, high school student there is. You ain't coming out of school until you graduate. If it takes you to 50 years, you'll be there 50 years. You'll be the only kid shaving in school. And, uh, and I was pretty lucky. Both of them graduated and then had a couple years of college. And I can't say that uh, uh, I didn't give, just give something to them. You know, but uh, 28 years was very interesting. It, uh, Learned a lot, meet a lot of people, and uh, it's just, you have to learn something at another time uh, about people themselves. Uh, that's basically about it.